you or read stories about them when you were a child. They came to you at night in whispers, the tales of phantom pirates with scarred faces and terrible murderous ways. Think back and recall the monsters sailing in from the void on the black deck of an evasive ghost ship, making way to the darkest corner of your dreams. Settle in, little one, because those ships were real. Welcome to the Dark Omnibus. In November of 1872, a captain, his wife, and their two-year-old daughter boarded the Mary Celeste accompanied by seven crew members. They had spent the week preparing for the trip, and now it was time to embark from New York on a month-long voyage to Genoa, Italy, but when the month had passed, the Mary Celeste failed to arrive at its destination. On December 5th of the same year, a crew member on a British brig, the De Gratia, spotted a ship adrift in the glassy seas. The De Grazia's captain was surprised to discover that the ship was none other than the Mary Celeste, which left New York City just over a week before his own ship and should have arrived in Italy by this time. He immediately changed course to offer assistance. A boarding party entered the ship and made their way below deck, and while they found the ship's charts in disarray, all the crew's belongings were still stowed neatly in their quarters. But the ship's lifeboat was missing, as was the entire crew, including the captain, his wife, and the two-year-old daughter, Sophia. The search party also found that one of the ship's two pumps had been fully disassembled, and three and a half feet of water filled the ship's bottom. They also found a storage area containing a full six months food and water supply. Unfortunately, the crew and the captain's family were never found, nor was their lifeboat, and what actually happened to the Mary Celeste remains a mystery to this day. Despite a last-minute switch in captains because the first captain became ill, the Carol A. Deering cargo ship and her 10-person crew arrived safely in Rio de Janeiro in 1920. However, the trip back to Virginia would prove far less uneventful. On January 29, 1921, the Carol Deering was more than a week into the return trip to Virginia from Barbados. A light ship keeper in North Carolina had approached the ship and noticed the crew milling about suspiciously on the deck, and a crewman who didn't seem like a real officer told the man that the ship had lost its anchors. The following day, a different lightship saw the Carol Deering close to the outer banks, which seemed an unusual path for a ship headed for Norfolk, Virginia. Then on December 31st, a Coast Guard officer saw a ship that had run aground and looked to be abandoned. The officer reported that the sails were set and the lifeboats were missing. Due to heavy seas, the search and rescue boats were unable to reach the helpless ship for a full four days, but when they finally made their way to the site of the wreckage, they discovered that it was actually the Carol Deering. They boarded the ship and found that food had been set out on a mess table as if the crew were getting ready for a meal. But despite an extensive search of the area, there was no crew to be found. The lifeboats, the crew, and all the crew's personal effects were missing. The federal authorities investigated leads regarding mutinies, pirates, and other probable causes, but none of them proved fruitful. The crew simply vanished, and they were never heard from again. This ghost ship legend lacks even a simple narrative, because there is so little of a backstory. In March of 2006, an Australian Coast Watch surveillance aircraft spotted a vessel floating freely in the Gulf of Carpentaria. Upon further inspection, the surveillance crew found no one aboard, but did notice a broken tow rope trailing from the ship's bow. The ship was the Jean Seng, but this information was only known because that was the name painted across the side of the ship. This is only notable because after a bit of research, authorities found that there was no record of who owned the ship, where it came from, or what happened to it, and any and all information available to investigators ended there. There was nothing more identifying the ship or its origins. Other than that name, Jean Seng, painted on the side, they found no paperwork, no logbooks, nothing. Also, there was never a missing ship reported that matched the name, and there were also no records of any distress signals having gone out. The best theory presented surmised that the ship most likely provided food and fuel to fishing boats in whichever geographical area it had come from, but that still doesn't explain why nobody attempted to retrieve the ship after it went adrift. On Halloween night in 2002, the fishing boat High Aim No. 6 departed Taiwan, and little was initially known about what happened to the boat and the crew over the next three months. But on January 8, 2003, the Australian Navy discovered the ship, and it was immediately apparent to them that something wasn't right. 
After boarding the ship, the authorities found no crew, but what was more alarming was that they also hadn't found any evident reason for the abandonment. There were no signs of distress, and all of the crew's personal belongings were left on board. They also found that the auxiliary fuel tanks were still full and untouched, but the main fuel tanks were empty, and the ship's throttle was fully open. The discoveries didn't end there. There were ten tons of Bonito tuna kept chilled on board, but again no crew members to be seen. In fact, a wide search of over 7,300 nautical miles was conducted, and no trace of the crew was found. This was slated to be one of the strangest ghost ship stories in history until authorities found one of the crew members. After being apprehended and interrogated, the Indonesian fishermen admitted that the crew had collaborated with pirates to assassinate the ship's captain and chief engineer, but authorities never learned why the man and his shipmates had turned on their captain, or where the other crew members had fled. In 2013, the crew of the Nina yacht contacted meteorologists with concerns about hazardous weather, but after short communication, the yacht's crew stopped responding. On May 29th, the Nina had set sail from New Zealand and was headed for Newcastle, Australia. The crew consisted of eight people, the yacht's owners, their 17-year-old son, a 73-year-old woman, two men, Kyle and Matthew, both aged 27 years, a 35-year-old member of the British Green Party, and 19-year-old Danielle Wright. Being an older boat, built in 1928, there was little to no modern technology on board, such as a long-range radio or an identification system. It did, however, have a satellite phone and a distress beacon. Over the next month, the crew kept in contact with the mainland and with their relatives via the satellite phone and through text messages when they were in an area that happened to have cell service. But on June 4th, meteorologist Bob McDavid received a series of weather-related text messages sent from someone aboard the Nina. But after several exchanges, the Nina messages suddenly stopped. It was soon learned that the ship had encountered a massive storm and were pummeled by 70 mile per hour winds and waves nearly 26 feet high. There continued to be no response from the ship for weeks, and understandably the outlook was grim. This would have proved to be the conclusion of a weeks long fruitless search effort if it weren't for a strange message that suddenly appeared. Bob McDavid, who had received the initial SOS calls from the Nina, received a text message that was previously undeliverable three weeks after the crew was last heard from. Thanks, it read. The storm sails were shredded last night. They're now bare poles. The text also mentioned that the ship was still on the move, but that was the last anyone would hear anything from the ship or its crew. In fact, both the boat and the crew would vanish and never be seen or heard from again. However, that text message was interpreted by the family of Daniel Wright as proof that she was still alive, disregarding the fact that the text was sent the same night as the disappearance. They insisted on hiring a private investigator, but during that investigation, they still found nothing. The ship and its crew had seemingly vanished and the Nina was never found. In November of 1955, Captain Douglas was on his way from Fiji to a small northern island in the South Pacific. Not long into his trip, he spotted something strange. A ship was floating to sea, tipped on its side so much that its port side deck rails were underwater. Soon after, a recovery party was organized, and after the sinking ship was boarded, it was learned that the ship's name was the MV Joyita, a cargo and fishing charter vessel that made regular trips around the South Pacific. After checking records, it was discovered that the MV Joyita had left for its destination on October 3rd and was expected to arrive at an island territory close to New Zealand two days later, but something had gone terribly wrong. The MV Joyita had left with 25 souls on board, including a doctor and a couple with two children who were 11 and 3 years old. But when rescuers arrived at the site, there was no sign of any of them on or around the ship. When the recovery team boarded the boat, what they found didn't inspire any hope. First, the boat's radio had been tuned to an international marine distress channel, which means the crew had been in obvious need of help. Also, the engine's clutch and one of the ship's pumps were fully disassembled and disconnected, so the ship had been running on one engine. All the clocks had been stopped at 10.25 p.m. What they didn't find were a logbook or navigational equipment, or any of the three lifeboats. What puzzled the recovery team was that the ship's bridge had been destroyed by something and had been covered with canvas, and the cabin windows had all been broken out. And finally, they found the doctor's bag on the deck, surrounded by a scalpel and a stethoscope, and several lengths of bloody gauze and bandages. Despite an extensive search, none of the crew were found. They had vanished, and had taken all the answers to this troubling scene with them. As recently as 2002, family members were still investigating what might have gone wrong, but no clues have been uncovered that might explain what happened to the MV Joyita. A 
A skipper and two brothers left for a two-month yacht trip around Australia, but three days into the voyage, tragedy struck. The Kaz 2 was discovered drifting off the coast of Australia, near the Great Barrier Reef, and there were many theories about what might have happened to the three crew members. One such theory was that the skipper, Des Batten, and the two brothers, Peter and John Tunstead, staged their own disappearance for some kind of insurance fraud scheme, or that they may have suffered an ill-timed demise at the hands of smugglers or pirates. Another wilder theory was that some sort of paranormal event had happened aboard the boat, and there were even those who compared Kaz 2's demise to that of the Mary Celeste. When the boat was found, the engine was idling, a cup of coffee and a laptop were found on a table, and a newspaper was lying open with a few of its pages seemingly tossed on the floor. They also found clothing piled on a bench in the cabin, but no crew members. One coroner's theory is that one crew member fell into the ocean, and the other two jumped in to save him, each man drowning during the rescue attempt. But since there is no actual evidence to support this, what happened to the crew will forever remain a mystery. In 1840, a whaling ship named Hope was moving through ice-laden water and found a schooner, the Jenny, completely frozen in ice in the Antarctic Drake Passage nearly 20 years after it first disappeared. When crew members from the Hope boarded the frozen ship, they found the entire Jenny crew aboard, completely frozen to death. Seven crew members stood on the deck, frozen solid. The captain was found sitting at his desk in his quarters, fully frozen. He held a pen in a hand that rested next to a journal. When the Hope's captain read the journal, the final entry read, May 4th, 1823. No food for 71 days. I'm the only one left alive. Each account from the Hope's crew members stated that the feeling on the frozen deck was eerie and haunted. Some crew members claimed that they held a funeral for the Jenny's captain and crew and buried them at sea. Others claim they simply took the journal and left the ship, afraid that the haunted vessel would spell doom for them all. But since the ghost ship Jenny was never seen again, it's believed that it is still frozen behind a wall of ice, waiting to be discovered once more. <laughs> 